in this talk, I'm going to, uh, it's more of an opinion piece than a theoretical demonstration. I'm going to argue that uh, recurrent neural networks as we know them are uh, close to finite state machines and that uh, we should view um, both uh, recent improvements to recurrent neural networks and sort of future research directions seeking to take us up in the computational hierarchy. So uh, because I often give this to mixed audience, I don't know uh, who knows what a recurrent neural network is and who doesn't. So just uh, sorry if everyone here knows this, but a very quick recap. A recurrent neural network has as its basic construction um, a recurrent cell, which is something which takes in an, a, a representation of an input symbol um, and a previous state and updates in its internal activations in order to produce a next state and um, a output a representation which might be used to predict, for example, a word or a symbol. Um, by allowing them to connect, um, so conceptually this sort of hidden layer that is going to be used uh, models the history of a sequence. Um, by, we talk about unrolling a recurrent cell over time to form a recurrent neural network um, in that it effectively con you're constructing on the fly a feed forward network with uh, shared weights uh, along the temporal dimension, or along the dimension of symbols. Um, and um, you can unfold it uh, in order to uh, process sequences of any length without a bound. Um, and these networks are successful in capturing long-range dependencies. So this kind of uh, class of models, this architecture sort of class, is an established uh, class for dealing with sequence data for the reasons I just specified. And the big turning point which took us from, uh, well, it's mathematically convenient to it's actually practically uh, usable, usable uh, was the um, discovery or invention of long short-term memory uh, by Hawkrider and Schmidt-Huber and then improved by Gers and Schmidt-Huber in the late 90s. Um, and it's popular because it's a, it's a relatively simple architecture which adapts very well across domains from uh, handwriting, rec handwriting recognition, speech rec recognition to machine translation. And in the first half of this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about what the failure modes of this architecture, of particular instances of this architecture, tell us, and what research, and then from there, take us to what research should focus on. But obviously, no one likes a negative talk, so I'm going to start by reviewing some notable successes of this architecture first. Um, so language modeling, again, uh, apologies if this is familiar to everyone, is the task of modeling the joint probability of a sequence of tokens, uh, for example, of English text. And uh, the, uh, the probability of a sequence of tokens um, factorizes nicely left to right or right to left, depending on your language, as the probability of the next token given the probability of the tokens you've seen so far, and taking the product of this across the sequence. Uh, until neural networks sort of took the lead, the popular way of uh, training and uh, running language models was to define n-gram models. Uh, these are uh, count-based models that will rely on an order n Markov assumption and, and other terms saying that the next symbol depends on, at most, the previous n symbols in order to do this. So simplification of that factorization. Um, and typically would just, um, you'd construct a matrix of counts and then smooth them in order to obtain these probabilities. Recurrent neural network cells, um, as I said, model in their activation the entire history of the sequence in theory. Um, so in contrast with n-gram models, they don't, they don't require you to specify an explicit bound on the history um, of what's going to condition the next symbol. So your, your model could technically depend on the first word that might have been a, a, in your document, which might have been a thousand words ago, and uh, in order to predict the next word in theory. Another um, set of tasks that uh, RNNs, especially LSTMs, have shown themselves to do quite successfully is sequence-to-sequence -sequence mapping or transduction. And so the idea here is you want to translate a sequence S and uh, a source sequence S into a target sequence T, and this might be you know translating French into English, but it might also be uh, translating code into some other code or a tree into some other tree or parsing. A lot of things kind of fit this idea, and the idea here is that we're simply going to treat this as a conditional language modeling problem with an RNN, in that we're going to want to model the conditional probability of the next target uh, sequence symbol, given the prefix of target sequence symbols already generated, and a representation of the source sequence. This representation of the source sequence could also be provided by another RNN, and it typically is. Um, a little example of, uh, what, of a sequence to sequence model would be neural machine translation. So here you want to have a, a probability distribution over French strings given, uh, over English strings given French strings for French to English translation. And so you'll read in the French string. Is there a laser pointer? Do people see this? No, it's, it, 
Okay, you read in the, um, the French string symbol by symbol, usually by embedding it first, um, into an RNN, updating the activations and ignoring the output until you reach a separator symbol between the strings, which could be some arbitrary holdout symbol, at which point you start generating the English translation of um, the French sentence, and you feed um, at training time the correct next word back in as an input uh, to have this autoregressivity. Um, and at test time, when you sample a particular word, you feed that as the input to the next step of the RNN. Um, and so gradients flow, the, the, the predictions, when you're training, the ground truth uh, predictions are, are up here. So any sort of loss is going to be with regard to the predictions at the far right of the model. But because everything's differentiable, you can propagate information via gradients back to the decoder and representations on the uh, encoder end. Another application of this exact same architecture that was uh, shown by Zoran Ben in 2014 was learning to execute. And the idea here is that you would read as a source uh, sequence a uh, Python program character by character, and the target sequence would be the result of that computation, which would again be output character by character with a full stop. Um, now, you have to take this result with a huge grain of salt in that when they were <coughs> testing their model, they used teacher forcing, which is feeding in the right character regardless of net whether or not you predicted it um, at the next step. So their accuracy results are a little misrepresentative. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact that it like, worked and that you know, if, you, if you do run this like, for fairly small sequences for like, completely unseen code at test time, does something vaguely sensible is still, um, if it was fairly mind-blowing at the time, and it should still be impressive now. Um, and uh, in our lab and many labs since, uh, sequence to sequence models have been adapted to do large scale uh, reading comprehension. So this is the task of reading a document, viewing a question about the document and having to answer it, where a question might be an actual natural language question or in a simpler form, a closed question where it's kind of a fill in the gap kind of thing. Um, and here you can think of the source sequence as being the combination of the document and the question, and you have to transduce that into a target, which is the word or words that belong in the uh, answer. So a lot of successes. Now let's talk about where the failure modes lie. Um, so language modeling, we, we see that while LSTMs make very good language models when you measure the perplexity of the model, uh, on held out English text, uh, we observe that practically they make only for very good local language models. As in, if you sample a sentence, it's going to look like English if you've trained it on a sufficient amount of English data and your model is big enough. But if you continue sampling, there's a point where you're going to quickly recognize that it's something coming from a machine rather than from um, a reasonably sober human. Um, and, and you won't see the sort of stuff that you normally see in human text, like topical consistency, uh, relational consistency. Um, when you're reading an article that starts out being about like uh, events in the White House, then you're, you'd be surprised if the f 10 sentences down the line is talking about water slide salesman. Although in these days, anything's possible. Um, uh, and uh, likewise, if you've seen a mention of a rare entity like um, Frege in a text, it actually becomes very likely to see it like even a few like 10 or 20 sentences down because the text is likely to be talking about something surrounding Frege. Um, whereas an LSTM language model will only work well locally but not capture this global consistency. There's a data set by Paperno and all in, uh, called Lambada, which I think is good to know because it really exemplifies this kind of uh, locality failure. Um, and it was created in this way. And this is a process, I think, that could be done to produce adversarial data sets for a variety of machine learning problems. Um, so they collect paragraphs from books of like three sentences. Uh, so you have a set of like three sentences, a, a set of paragraphs of contiguous sentences from a text that have some sort of theme. Um, and the task is going to be remove the last word from the third sentence. And you, you read the three sentences and you have to predict that last word. So it's just one step of language modeling. So they start by having annotators do this task and predict what the last word is given um, the three previous sentences. And they remove all the paragraphs from their data set where humans can't reasonably agree. Then the second step is they train a bunch of language models, uh, ngram and LSTM based, uh, and have them predict the last word in the remaining paragraphs that are still held in. And now where the machines are capable of predicting it, you throw those away. So you have a remaining part of your data set where humans should be able to solve the problem, but machines shouldn't. And as an extra uh, and perhaps optional step, they again have annotators, I assume new annotators, predict the last unseen word seeing only the last sentence and throw those away where they're agreeing. So now you only have 
uh, paragraphs in your data set that machines can't predict the last word. Humans can, but they have to use the information from at least the previous two sentences or previous three sentences, not just the last one. Um, and that's a nice sort of test set. They provide some training data too. People have worked on this and then it became quickly a lot of people in machine learning realized this is too hard, so it's, it's somehow fallen uh, out of the public eye, but that's not due to any problem with it. It's due to a problem with the community. Um, uh, in sequence-to-sequence -sequence modeling, and I mean just kind of vanilla sequence-to-sequence -sequence modeling, we see other sort of problems um, that I like to refer to as a transduction bottleneck. Um, so when you're uh, reading in, you, when you're translating the sentence of French, you read in character by character, and then you start generating. And the distribution over the target <coughs> words is obviously a function of what you've generated so far, so it's locally autoregressive. Auto but the conditioning information of the source sequence is all in the activations at this boundary, right? So there's a finite, even though you, you might keep around this computation for the purpose of computing gradients, you don't use it. You only use the information that's in this state to predict the entirety of the French sentence, of the English sentence. So all the information of the French sentence has to be in one or two vectors, or depending on how many layers you have. And we see this causes quite a few problems. Obviously, there's a notion of not adaptive capacity. So I mean, there are no perfect compressors. So as longer and longer French sentences are observed, it's reasonable to expect there to be some compressive loss and that it's, uh, it's, there's only so much information you can remain, uh, remember. So you have to make your, either your model bigger and retrain it or accept that you're, you, there's a limit on how much you can translate. We also observed during training that target sequence modeling dominates training. So this means that if you were to like, run your model on a test set, um, while you're training it, uh, during the first, I guess, 80% of training, a number pulled out of nowhere, but during the majority of the early stages of training up until like fairly late, you would notice that it would first learn to produce valid English, right? So you, the translation would be a valid English sentence, but it wouldn't have any semantic relation to the source, right? And only after the last sort of stages of training would it learn to, to adjust that, that marginal language model towards a conditional language model and properly translate. And the reason why is because the encoder in this sort of setup is gradient starved. So while you're getting gradient of uh, the prediction error with regard to your parameters and activations through a very short path on the target side, that gradient needs to flow through a lot of nonlinearities back into the encoder end to learn the representations and gradients with regard to the weights on the encoder side, which is why it takes a significantly longer to learn that, that part of the model. So that's not good. Um, and a more sort of like theoretical uh, limitation, we did a bunch of experiments on simple, very, very simple tasks. So copying and reversing arbitrary sequences, um, things that you could obviously solve with one line of Python, so not an interesting scientific uh, result but is in its, on its own right, but in relation to the limitations of RNN, this is quite telling. So we sampled sequences uh, of length 8 to 64. We've put some arbitrary bounds on length. And then we, for once we had sampled a length of a sequence, we just sample some random integers in a vocabulary of, let's say, 100 random, random words. So we're not, there's no longer any local regularity on the source or the target side. All of the regularity is global in the pair of sequence sense, in that the, the meaning of a target sequence word is formed by an arcing dependency to something in the source. And then the target, so the target sequence is just simply the reversal or a copy of the source sequence. Um, it turns out that if you do sequence-to-sequence -sequence models with LSTMs and you, you, know, you have a big hidden layer and you train it for a long time, and at the time we did this experiment it was a matter of a, a week, and with GPUs now we could probably do this in a day, but a long time relative to the actual complexity of the problem, it gets up to about 98% predictive accuracy in terms of like, the number of sequences it perfectly predicts. Um, and it will generalize, and even for a simple setup like this, yeah, the, the number of data points in this generative process is like significantly more than there are atoms in the universe. Um, so you, I think, um, so, but you, you, you're unlikely to see a data point twice. You can avoid that by hashing. The, the point is when you test it on unseen data within those length bounds, it will generally correctly copy it or reverse it. So it, it generalizes to, on content. However, when you, does it generalize on length? So if you test it on sequences of, say, length 65 and above, we notice an immediate failure of the copying mechanism or the reversal mechanism at the 64th digit. So it doesn't learn, even no matter how big you make the network and how long you train it, it will not learn to successfully generalize on structure, on being able to understand structure outside of the bounds it's seen before. And crucially, making your network bigger and um, 
more fancy in this sense doesn't help. OK, so we've reviewed some successes and failures. And based on these sort of failure modes, I want to ask the question and then uh, not answer it, but sort of give an argument for uh, where RNNs belong uh, on this computational hierarchy. And so I'm guessing most people are familiar with the notion of a computational hierarchy. We st they're, they're theoretical machines that we use to describe models of computation. And we start from finite state machines that have transitions between states. If you add a stack, you have a pushdown automata. And then if you have a tape that you can arbitrarily modify, we have Turing machines, which form the theoretical foundation of modern computers. And each of these is an equivalence class in terms of uh, formal languages, from regular languages up to computable functions or primitive recursive functions of arithmetic. And according to a result by, uh, a proof by Siegelman and Sontag in 1995, uh, uh, vanilla RNN, not even fancy LSTMs, um, is at the top of this hierarchy in that if you take an arbitrary um, Turing machine, you can encode it as an RNN by picking the weights. By, you can, there are specific weights uh, and, a, and a specific size. That means that you'll get just a standard RNN that will act as a Turing machine. And that will be equally expressible. Um, and much like uh, universal function approximation theorems um, for uh, standard feed four neural networks, it's important to say that can express doesn't mean can learn. So just because you can express this doesn't mean that that's what tractably and practically speaking you're learning. So I'm going to argue that, in fact, we're closer to here. With an LSTM or with GRUs or simple RNNs, I mean, so they can all express a Turing machine. That's no, no, no doubt about that. But are they going to be learning Turing machines through the, uh, so, the sort of normal standard uh, sequence-based maximum likelihood training that we usually train them with? Um, and I'm going to give you some sort of very high-level arguments against these. And you may disagree with these, but any good workshop talk, I think, should get people riled up enough to have a chat after. Um, so recurrent neural networks, when you're training them, don't control the tape. They're not exposed to information in a way that they can control. So uh, each update of their internal state, if we sought to internalize the tape, for example, um, or uh, each movement along the tape, if we treat the external data as being on the tape, uh, is completely controlled um, and not something that the, um, the RNN has any sort of decision over, uh, factor over. So the sequence is exposed in a force order. The maximum likelihood objective produces also models that are going to be close to, to, to approximating the training data distribution. So they, there's no incentive in, this, in, the, in the very training regime we use to get them to like, think about what could go beyond the data. And although there are ways around this to be sort of like a weekly Bayesian about your model by putting regularization, uh, constraints on the weights, on the norm of the weights, uh, or saying that they're going to be Gaussian distributed, I don't think it's reasonable to expect this very naive sort of res uh, regularization to yield the sort of like a structured compositional model within the RNN weights uh, that's going to give you good out of sample generalization mechanism. So the way in which we train them is in fact kind of contrary to the result. It, 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 it's unlikely and it's sort of moving in a different direction than the a sort of training process that would yield very sparse, uh, very structured weights that uh, are used by Siegelman and Sontag to demonstrate the expressivity. Um, and obviously, if we had a better way of training these things, uh, that might solve the problem. But I, I'm not going to even talk about that because I have no idea where to start. Um, instead, I want to think about the, the RNNs that we see in practice, the ones that we train, uh, or the, the trained ones that produce the results that impress us so much are in fact uh, closer to approximations of finite state machines. Um, primarily on the basis that uh, the data shows us that they cannot generalize on a structure outside of the bounds that they've seen. So in practice, we see that uh, whether it's a language model or a sequence to sequence model, they're effectively, at the end of training, an order n uh, Markov chain. Uh, but n doesn't need to be specified at design time by the architect or by the software engineer, or however you want to name yourself. Um, instead, it's specified by the data. Um, if, if this is true, so if they are, in fact, just approximations of, I'm guessing, very large finite state machines, they're, in theory, memoryless. And so people will say, well, no, evidently, we're translating, so there's some notion of memory. But obviously, you can simulate memory through dependencies in a regular language. So for example, if you have a regex like dot star a dot 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 a, um, this, the recognition model tells you that it will recognize any string that has at the end an a followed by three arbitrary symbols followed by another a. 
you can turn this into a prediction model over the last symbol that says, okay, I have the probability that A is the next symbol given A was seen four symbols ago. And so this is quite trivial, but in a sense, I think this is a sort of mechanism that the data is getting the uh, LSTMs to learn in these copy and reversal tasks, and in fact, in all sequence to sequence modeling. So this, in, this basically uh, gives them memory, but it's a very bounded or limited form of memory. And there's no incentive or capability under the standard way in which we train these things through maximum likelihood objectives to learn dependencies that go beyond the sort and the range observed uh, in the training data. So this, you might say, okay, well, why, why, we seem to be doing pretty well empirically, so um, why, why is this a problem? And there's two arguments against this. First, um, if you're satisfied with having bound, bound memory and just saying it's going to be bounded by the data, um, you're going to still run into problems in scalability. Um, if the recurrent neural network state, in a sense, is acting both as the controller, saying, okay, what's going in and out of memory, and um, what's going to be used in my memory to predict the next symbol, um, but it's bounded. It's a, it's a fixed information reservoir, um, unless you have a, an architecture that can grow its hidden layer, but that doesn't make, um, that's not something simple. Um, which means longer dependencies are going to require more memory. If you want to capture longer and longer dependencies, you're going to make you're going to need to like, in a sense, almost exponentially scale your hidden layer. If you want to track more dependencies in order to capture copying to like properly capture all these arcing relationships, you're going to need a bigger network. Um, and more complex and structured dependencies that might interrelate are going to require more memory. So in a sense, it's not a very scalable proposition in the first place. You might also think, okay, well, I'm actually pretty happy with being at the finite state level because uh, I'm, uh, I disagree with linguists who think that languages, natural languages is at least context-free, um, so therefore needs at least a push down automata. But even if you're satisfied with like, your problem being solvable by a, by a finite state machine or being a context-free uh, language, uh, real parsimony is something that matters greatly in terms of not just like, the efficiency of your model but data efficiency. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean with an example. So if we take like the smallest um, non-regular language, context-free language um, that's typically taught in undergraduate courses, which is A and B N, meaning that you see a number of A's and then followed by a, nat a matching number of B's, uh, there's no finite state machine that will recognize this language because it's regular. It's not regular. Um, but if in practice, uh, like in most formal languages, if you put a, an upper limit on the number of A's you're going to see and therefore the number of B's, so if there's a cap by a capital N, then it becomes regular again. But let's take a look at how you would describe um, this language. Well, the regular language for that capped version would be basically uh, an enumeration of all the possible cases that could exist in it. Um, so you're going to have, if you see each disjunct as a rule, uh, you have n plus 1 rules to describe that regular language. Whereas the context-free grammar that recognizes the original context-free language is going to be two rules, and if you want to be generous and say you need to recognize the bound, you can add a stack and add a third rule that will basically capture the counting aspect. So think to yourself, it's like I have a model that effectively can learn through a training process to internalize a, a finite state machine versus one that can learn to internalize a push down automaton, which one's going to have a harder time learning how to solve this problem? The one that needs to learn two or three rules internally or internalize, or the one that needs to internalize n plus one rules? And I think most people would agree that it's like you want to go for the case where there's fewer rules to learn from the data. I'll give some empirical evidence for this in a bit. So uh, I'd argue that right now, no matter how impressive the results on language modeling and sequence modeling and handwriting recognition, and they are impressive. They are, they're great progress in, in uh, being used in a variety of applications, including commercial products. Um, the RNNs that we know and love are, my, by and large, here unless we enhance them. They're the state of finite state machines, and we'd like to be around here. So I'm going to talk in the second, uh, in the last half of this talk, about um, efforts since 2014 that have been made to um, take a step up in the hierarchy and uh, comment a bit about whether or not they've been successful. So I want us to think about recurrent networks more than just as being sort of uh, vanilla RNNs or LSTM or GRUs, which you know, have minor structural differences, but more as being a sort of general API for something that you can unroll over across time to have to be able to deal with dynamic sequences. And in a sense, this API looks like this. It's like you have a black box where you assume everything inside is differentiable. It takes at each step, time step inputs in a previous state and produce outputs 
and a next state. And an LSTM fits this API. I mean, LSTMs have a lot more wiring than the standard RNN, but it's still whatever's happening in, inside is all differentiable, so you're happy. Uh, but it's effectively still just doing the same thing, taking inputs, producing outputs, and updating its state. And as long as whatever's inside this box fits this kind of constraint, that there's a well-defined gradient uh, with regard uh, of the output uh, with regard to the input in the previous state and of the next state with regard to the input in the previous state, then you can, float, you can pass information forward and flow gradient information back and train the whole thing end to end. So that's all we really need at the high level for something to qualify as a recurrent network. So that means we can put more into this box than currently there is with the sort of standard very basic RNNs and people have. In particular, I talked about the, problem stemming, the problems that RNNs face stemming from the fact that you just had one unit acting both as the controller and the memory. So why don't we actually explicitly segment this in the box and imagine that there's a memory and a controller, both of which have a previous state and update that state based on the inputs, and that the controller deals with the input and output and interacts with the memory at each time step. And there are a few architectures that fit the bill. The first is attention, which exists in two forms, which I won't go into in great detail. Uh, in attention, you assume that you have a, uh, a list of vectors that's provided to you at the beginning of computation. Um, and I'll describe where those might come from. That you don't get to touch, but you get to read. So it's a sort of form of read-only memory. And you can read these in, in two kind of ways using an LSTM controller or, an RNA or whatever RNN you like. Uh, either you can take the previous state of the RNN and the input and decide to read and update your internal state um, at a particular time step. This is called early fusion because you attend to the memory before the recurrent update. Or there's late fusion where you read the memory based on the current state and only use that to influence the output. And these have pros and cons, which I, I, I won't talk in, for the, in the interest of time. An example of attention applied to sequence to sequence modeling is uh, let's revisit this transduction bottleneck. We said previously that you know, you'd, we'd retain all this computation here in order to be able to compute gradient updates, um, but we'd only use the information at the boundary in order to predict the target sequence. Well, why don't we? These, are actually, these could actually be good representations of the words that are at these particular positions. So why not use it? And attention does precisely that. When we, 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 we save all the computation as we are encoding to produce a matrix of vectors that stand for uh, semantic information at each position. And when we decode, we not only predict the next word based on the current state of the RNN, but that state gets to query this matrix by looking, basically doing a parametrized inner product and then normalizing via softmax to produce a distribution. Takes a weighted sum of the according, basically does a, a mean approximation of, of, of the matrix according to what is most similar to it, and then uses that information to uh, predict the next word. You can think of this as just a, a soft uh, differentiable querying mechanism of information that's in the past. This also this means that a on the forward pass that the the um, necessity to form a long range dependency is the responsibility is pushed out of the activations of the RNN on its own and, and its weights but also into the representations it can produce in the past, and that if you can just say, oh, I kind of remember I need to look for this and then retrieve it, that, that allows you to form that long-range dependency without going through all this nastiness. In terms of gradient, because that's a differentiable operation, um, gradient not only flows through the controller, but also through these arcing, through these queries, which means that gradient has this sort of more direct channel into the encoder, and we know that it's much faster training. So it's solving sort of two problems in one go. So there's some limitations to this, obviously. Um, first of all, it's read-only, so you don't get to sort of like do things like annotate what you've read previously or say, I've satisfied that alignment in order to not have to align again. It's fairly constrained in the sort of alignments it can capture. So you can do one-to-one -one or one-to-many, but you can't really do sort of like very structured alignments saying, OK, if I've aligned to this in the past and, I'm ali and, this, and these two words translate nicely into one word in English, then I'm going to like, you know, jointly capture this information. Um, also, if you, think, if you think about scaling this between sequence to sequence at the word level to like, you know, doing atten attention over the entire internet, there's a problem that the source representations obtain gradient and typically must be updated across all the documents you're looking at every time you change your model because you want to be able to produce information uh, on the encoder end that will be exploited by the decoder successfully. So it's an expensive kind of process if you want to scale it beyond sentences. Um, as you scale as well, 
um, you um, risk attending to things that aren't directly relevant to, it's, because it's a, it's a soft form of alignment, you risk attending to sort of distracting information in a longer sequence. And so there's a risk of information overload as the sequences get longer, um, because there's no explicit sense of saliency baked into this model. So by and large, it's an interesting approach if you really need read-only memory on a small scale, but scalability remains one of the main issues with this approach. So we've seen this sort of attention as including a read-only memory in, um, in, your, in your recurrent cell. Uh, and this, despite its limitations, has been is one of the sort of most commonly used mechanisms across uh, a variety of sequence modeling problems leading to state-of-the-art um, translation, neural machine translation results. But what if we not only got to read from the memory at each time step, but also got to write to it? So doing something like this and treating the memory like a register memory. Well, there's a variety of models that fit the bill. And I, won't, I don't have enough time to go into detail, but the neural Turing machine by Graves and al., the uh, DNC, again, by uh, Greg Wayne and Alex Graves and colleagues in 2014 and 2015, memory networks from Facebook, a variety of uh, extensions to neural Turing machines by Montreal, all fit the bill of having this sort of differentiable register memory or random access memory um, that you can access at each time step. So this looks a lot more like a Turing machine. So you're explicitly saying that I have something internally in my recurrent cell uh, that persists over time that corresponds to that tape that you see in a Turing machine. Obviously, it's bounded, uh, but so is the uh, RAM and register memory that we have in an actual practical computers. So we can't throw it out just because of that. The controller uh, can control the tape motion via various mechanisms. It could use an attention mechanism to retrieve by value, uh, or it could re retrieve by address by having an index pointer that it can, can evolve or shift. And the recurrent neural network can model the state transitions of the uh, read head in a Turing machine. Um, and so it looks like it's a much more plausible way of saying, if we're going to learn a Turing machine from the data, uh, might as well make it an NTM or a DNC or something like this. Nonetheless, the same objections that we had against uh, being able to learn Turing machines from RNNs still apply here. Crucially, when you're doing maximum likelihood-based training, the number of computation steps is tied to the data. So uh, even though you might be learning to uh, read a sequence and then sort it, you only get to tick uh, two to the n times. Um, in fact, in the early uh, NTM papers, one of the experiments was, in fact, sorting digits. Uh, and everyone thought that was amazing. And I don't think anyone stopped at that point to say, isn't it strange that we're successfully sorting sequences in n time uh, when most sorting algorithms are uh, n log n? Uh, obviously, there are uh, linear time sorting algorithms like radix sort that rely on hashing, but they don't generalize outside of the sort of data you see um, that you, well, sorry, outside of the data that you see, you'll see, uh, which is in fact also true of the NTM. Um, so that's kind of crucial. You, while, while you can update your tape, you can't say, OK, I want to do like a dynamic time algorithm that's going to depend on the sort of structure of the data. Uh, in practice, because of this, it's unlikely to learn a very general algorithm uh, because it can't go beyond linear time for anything interesting. But experiments do show, especially in the Graves paper, uh, that you find better generalization on symbolic tasks. So while this adding a register memory is, is, is a powerful mechanism that takes you closer to a Turing machine, it hasn't really sort of yielded the sort of like free lunch that we're all apparently hoping for, despite theorems telling us we're never going to get them. So um, it's also very difficult to train because there's a lot of moving parts. So we talked about like um, finite state machines, vanilla RNNs. We talked about bringing them up with a RAM and then making that, um, sorry, make with a ROM and then making that a RAM that brings us up to something that's close to Turing machines. But what about that step in between where you have push down automata? Well, uh, both our group and some of our colleagues at Facebook uh, concurrently worked on neural push down automata in 2015 where, again, we sort of have this idea of there being an RNN acting, uh, acting as a controller and taking input and output at each time step. But at each time step, it also gets to write to a stack or a queue or double-ended queue and read from the head of that stack or queue or double-ended queue uh, or any other sort of order-dependent um, data structure. And um, in order for this to be able to be done and trained end-to-end, -end, uh, a differentiable version of these data structures needs to be posited, which you can read about in those papers if you want. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly skip through um, the API of our own stack and just give you some results that will take us back to this idea of internalizing roles. So we had in experiments to test whether or not a stack-enhanced or a queue-enhanced recurrent neural network 
could transduce these sequences with no local regularity. So simply copying and reversing and learning nested structures or like we had these pseudo -ger German gender conjugation tasks. Um, and the uh, training curves, which in fact you can take as testing curves because you can also, you, we, we can, the data set is so big it's, that we're never going to see anything twice. Um, look a little like this. The LSTMs, which we use as baselines, and we made them quite big and we trained them for quite a long time, will uh, increase in accuracy as they train and slowly but surely get to about like 98% accuracy, which for most people would be a satisfactory result if you ignore the fact that we're solving a problem that you can solve with one line of Python. Um, but it takes a long time to get there, and it's very progressive. So in a sense, this looks a lot like, okay, I'm ha having to slowly like traverse enough data to learn this disjunction of n plus one rules. Whereas the same sort of basic architecture, one layer LSTM enhanced with a neural pushdown automata or Q or a DEC with a blended Q, will, when training, shoot up to 100% accuracy after a very small proportion of the data that's been seen by the overall model and stay there. So in that sense, and again, this is very hand wavy, so I'm not asserting, I'm just suggesting that it's learning something like this very two, this is a very small like two rule set or several, uh, like a very minimal number of rules. It's just learning to manipulate the data structure in order to be able to learn a more general process rather than just let the data enumerate all the cases. Um, and also we noticed that when we uh, tested on uh, longer sequences, so we, we trained on sequences of length up to 64 and then tested on 65. As I told you, the LSTMs on their own would suffer from catastrophic failure, whereas the same thing, an LSTM paired with a stack or a queue, depending on the task, would, would be able to continue and persist in having the correct results up until you know, maybe two or three times uh, that, that bound, and at some point it does forget to count, but it, we immediately see generalization slightly, and in fact quite more than slightly, outside of the uh, training data bounds. Um, so these uh, approaches by both our group and by uh, Facebook's uh, provide decent approximations of classical pushdown automata, and you could imagine um, distilling them into actual pushdown automata at the end of training by discretizing. Um, and they introduce an architectural bias towards recursive and nested dependencies, which is a double-edged sword. So if your problem requires uh, you know, modeling recursive or nested dependencies and you pick the right architecture, so recursive, for example, for uh, a stack, or, uh, then you're, it's a win because it's going to hopefully learn how to exploit that data structure to do that. If you pick the wrong architecture or the wrong data structure, uh, so for example, you try and use a stack to copy, which you, it'll come out in the wrong order, uh, and then obviously you get no win and the controller just reverts to being an LSTM on its own. So architectural bias is, is good and that you get data efficiency, but it obviously um, causes the extra problem that you need to think about that bias. And obviously this should be useful for syntactically rich natural language and other applications that require capturing that sort of structure, um, but little work has been done. And obviously the same limitation of the memory operations operate in lockstep with input-output um, are still relevant. So to conclude, complexity is needed to take us beyond push down automata, so beyond finite state machines or the sort of like very big sort of relaxations of finite state machines that RNNs are currently modeling. If we really want to move beyond sort of impressive results uh, of approximating um, data distributions we don't fully understand to something that's going to be able to learn a process or a generalizable sort of program internally in its weights. Uh, but it's also easy to design an overly complex model, so a lot of thought needs to go into the level of complexity that you want. It's better to understand the limits uh, of existing models with regard to specific problems and then really use that as a basis for thinking, okay, it's like, what is the minimum unit I need? It's like, okay, for translation, attention seemed to be that. Um, for translation at the document level, it's going to be something else. <laughs> By understanding the limits, uh, the limitations of your architecture and their nature, often you can find a better solution will just simply pop out through analysis. And I think the, really the best example of this is uh, chapters one through three of Felix Gero's thesis. If you haven't read it, there's an exposition about LSTMs, but simply showing the vanishing gradient problem for RNNs. And then when you read the way he's written it, you read it, it's like obviously adding gates is the way to solve this. It's a, it's a very, very cool, very cool uh, set of chapters. So I think not just about the model, but about the complexity of the problem and about the limitations of your model with regard to the, that complexity in order to you know, guide your future research. Thank you.